We're going to finish off this session now by asking Cassandra Carius from Harbottle and Lewis to talk about the practicalities of a real issue, which is replay and Siobhan Davis and your work with them, I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. My name's Cassandra Carius. I'm a senior associate at the law firm Harbottle and Lewis. We're a media and entertainment practice. I actually work in the film and television group, but we work very closely with the theatre group as well. I'm also a member of the board of Siobhan Davis Dance, and so when I was asked if I could help with the clearance process, I was more than happy to. So thank you, Naomi, firstly, for setting the scene so beautifully in explaining this bundle of resources and the importance of making sure that the scope of per permissions that we achieve are exactly what we need for the, for the end result, for our users to be able to use and enjoy this archive, which has been such a huge task to put together, as we've seen from Sarah. So that was the task we were faced with. Um, in the 10, 15 minutes I have, I'll just touch very briefly on the different types of clearance that we identified were going to be necessary. Then I'll give you a bit more of an idea of the negotiations that went on when we actually approached the contributors with our draft documents, so you can see where the areas of contention were. And then lastly, just a couple of practical notes on how we manage the task for this particular archive. So firstly, coming back to Naomi's bundle of resources, we sat down with the company and had a look at all the types of rights and the types of material we were going to be dealing with so that we could see what documents we were going to need to draft for our bundle. So the rights fall into three main groups. We were dealing with copyright, performer's rights, and moral rights. So in our copyright heading, we had the choreography, which in most cases would have been owned by Siobhan Davis herself, but it may have been the case that through the collaboration of works that might have been co-authored. The audiovisual recordings of the work would have their own separate copyright, and so we would need to approach the owners of those recordings. Again, we were assuming in most cases that that would be the actual dance company involved, both Siobhan Davis Dance and the other dance companies that she's worked with over the years. On the musical side, we're looking at compositions, so we knew we'd be approaching composers and publishing companies. It may well have been the case that we needed to approach recording rights owners as well, separately, because musical recording rights are very often held by different owners to the, to the publishing rights. And then we had photographers, set designers, lighting designers, and other artistic collaborators, so we knew we were dealing with a, a large group of people. Then on the performer's rights side, we're dealing really with the dance artists, the musicians, and other artistic collaborators. And so we had two basic template documents that we started with, and they then kind of splintered off into various forms to deal with the rights that we needed to deal with. For the copyright owners, we had a license document, and for the performers, we had a performance release. And then the moral rights, Moral rights are owned both by copyright owners and performers, so they were fed into the two basic forms of document that we were working with. So armed with our first drafts, we set off to um, a smaller group of contributors and tested them out. And so to give you a flavour of the points, the points that were raised, what I've done is pull out four key points that were the areas of most discussion to give, to give you a good idea. So the first point is that we were seeking confirmation that the person signing the document actually owned the rights we were talking about, that they were the sole owner of those rights we were talking about, and that they didn't need anybody else's permission in order to be able to sign the document. Now, it all sounds very straightforward and obvious, but as Naomi has already explained, the person giving you the material won't necessarily own or even know who owns what they're giving you. So in the case of a musical composer and one musical composition that he or she has solely written themselves and they're unsigned to a publishing company, fine, really simple, great. They can say, yep, yeah, tick that box, no problem. In the case of audiovisual recordings that are perhaps lurking at the back of the library of Rombert or the Royal Ballet, it becomes a bit more complex. Because we didn't have first-hand knowledge of the ownership of the underlying rights in the material, our starting position was to ask that dance company just to confirm that they owned all the underlying rights in that material, except, of course, Sue's choreography, which we knew was probably going to be owned by her. A bold first position, and the answer soon came back that that just simply wasn't going to be the case. It was clear very early on that we were going to have to clear the music, the set, 
the lighting design, the photographs for each and every piece of audio material held by everybody else. So all of, all of a sudden, our task just suddenly exploded in front of us. I mean, it was going to be huge. For me, it was a very interesting comparison with film and television productions, which I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, where producers ensure that all the rights are transferred immediately at the outset over to the producer, or for television, there at least there's at least a royalty formula set out in advance. Everybody knows exactly where they are. And the owner, the producer, owns that finished product that the company has spent all that time creating. And they can then deal with it freely going forwards throughout the world for whatever purpose they wish to do. This is very different to the world of theatrical performance clearances, which tend to be very focused on just allowing that performance or that tour or run of performances to take place. Either future uses just aren't in the contemplation of the parties, or if recordings are allowed of those performances, there are very specific prohibitions. You're not allowed to broadcast it afterwards. You're not allowed to make it available or let it have a commercial life of its own. So not only did we not have very much paperwork for the decades of work, decades of work that Sue had created, in some cases we had paperwork that was going to ex expressly prohibit what we wanted to do with the archive. So in this theatrical performance world, fantastic. The contributors get to hang on to their rights. Great for them, how lovely. But, and it also gives them the chance to negotiate for more money, for royalties or further fees as soon as somebody starts talking about an additional form of exploitation. So that brings me neatly on to our second key point, money. So the archive was always intended to be a not-for-profit um, endeavour, and so the artists were all being asked to sign up to a royalty-free licence. Now, many contributors were more than happy to do that in support of the project, in support of Siobhan Davis and the company, and they agreed to that without hesitation or question. A few others were a little bit more circumspect, and you might say quite rightly so. So a few of the dancers asked us for a bit more information about the archive. How will it be made available? Will there be a charge to the users primarily to access this material? And in particular, they wanted an assurance that there wouldn't be two tiers of access, that some material would be made available to all, and perhaps other more choice pieces of material only available to subscribers at a fee. Interesting, because it touches on you know, alternative business models and maybe low res and high res. They were very, very kind of aware of this and wanted to know exactly what we were going to be up to. Now, the archive partners were clear from the start there was going to be no charge for access to the archive, so that really wasn't an issue. We could give that confirmation. And on that basis, the contributors started to become more comfortable, some more quickly than others, with the idea of it being a royalty-free license. They wanted it enshrined in the document, though, interestingly. So our license documents do make it very clear that it must be made available to the public without any charge whatsoever. Now, that's not normally a restriction a lawyer would like to put into a document, but we had to put it there to get them signed. So that brings us on to the third key point, which was the exact scope of the permissions being granted, which again comes back to Naomi's point of making sure our users can do everything they want to do, or we want them to do, with the bundle of resources. And it ties in with the fact that we're dealing with a royalty-free license. If this is a free license, surprise, surprise, these kind of closely examining artists wanted to make sure that the license was very narrow, very specific to the immediate task at hand and that we weren't going to be able to start raising huge sums of commercial money off the back of this material that we were now clearing. So when a lawyer drafts a, a license document, we kind of follow a very standard formula. You set out the introduction to what the purpose is, which is including the work on the archive. You then give very specific examples of the exact activities that the archive partners know they have to do. So we have five or six headings of activities that we must pre-clear. And to give you an idea of those, it would be the right to make a digital surrogate from the old film that had been dug out of the libraries for inclusion in the, light, in the archive. We also had the right to include supporting analytical information, which you've seen from the demonstrations. And so that contained data about the material, the contributors themselves, and the artists appearing in the material. And so we had to give assurances that no sensitive personal data was going to be used to make sure that we didn't fall foul of the Data Protection Act. 
We had a specific permission to prepare indexes, databases, catalogues. These need, additional, these need specific mention because you're going to be using reproduced images and clips. So again, it's an activity that you want to make sure you're allowed to do. And then we had a specific permission to prepare promotional materials related to the archive. Now again, this is another one that got, got the attention of the artist. They wanted to make sure that they would be non-commercial promotional materials. They didn't want to see Sue's next tour suddenly being promoted off the back of this, or the company, or the building. This was really just for the archive. They were really looking at it very closely. So that gives you a flavour of the specific activities. But then, like I say, as a lawyer doing a licence, you then always sweep up at the end with, oh, and anything else we haven't quite thought of yet, please. Um, which is to sort of cover the ancillary stuff, or as, you're, as Sarah said, this is a 30-month project, and some, when you're six months in and you suddenly say, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could, no, sorry, we can't, or how about, no, sorry, we can't, or but we really need, no, sorry, you can't. So you always try to add in this and anything else we haven't thought of, hoping that the person signing it kind of recognises it's in the spirit of the archive, in the spirit of the project, in the spirit of the fact that this archive is going to be made available free of charge, and so on. Unfortunately, our dancers weren't too happy with this. Royalty free kind of changed their minds a little bit. I'm just talking about, you know, two or three kind of across the groups of artists. Um, they're saying, no, if this is royalty free, then we don't want additional uses. What, what are you trying to do here? We don't want to suddenly see educational DVDs being created or dance films being sold, as Sarah's just given you an example. Um, if there's going to be money coming in, maybe we should be getting a slice of that pie. So in the end, we had to just concede the point, really, and, and strike out the additional uses clause. Um, so what we're left with is a very narrow, very specific permission that allows the archive to be created, but it allows that archive to be used um, in its full by users for educational use, research, and private use. So as you've seen from Sarah's example, there are side projects coming out of the archive, but they all have an educational or research feel. It's not, it's not a commercial activity. So the last point that I wanted to cover was the one of moral rights, which again Naomi touched on. Um, the, the moral right really that we were looking at was the right to object to a derogatory treatment of your work. Now the words derogatory treatment sound quite dramatic, but really it covers any kind of meddling with the work itself, so selecting it, cutting it, editing it, all the things that our team needed to be able to do in order to create the archive. So it's crucial that this right is waived, if you like. And that was a point that we just couldn't move on. So we gave the artists a bit more, um, more practical assurances, really. As, um, as Sarah touched on, for material being brought out from the 70s, this is quite a sensitive area, certainly for the dancers. And so the assurances that were given were firstly that it would be primarily Siobhan Davis herself and Deborah Saxon who would be working with that material, making the selections, doing the editing process. And so that made the dancers much more comfortable knowing that the material was in safe, friendly hands. The second assurance that was given was the way we were going to treat this rehearsal footage or the scrap notes as Sarah has described. So these, this material was only going to be made available to subscribers and to become a subscriber, you had to apply for that process. Not pay, note, but apply. And you had to demonstrate a genuine and serious interest in accessing that material before you could do so. So again, I think with those very practical assurances, we got to the position where the dancers were happy to sign what looks on the face of the document as a very blanket waiver of moral rights. So that, I hope, gives you a flavour of the negotiation process. And the document did go through you know, a fair few changes before it was in a form that could then be sent out to everybody to sign, and quite rightly so. So just to close, a couple of notes on how we managed the process. So the first step was to, uh, to um, agree a draft licence document and a release document with Coventry University, our partner, and make sure that these documents covered off all the basic needs we were going to need for the archive to go ahead. Then we tested out this draft on a close group of contributors, primarily the dancers in the company at the time and a few other kind of artistic collaborators that we knew would engage in this kind of process with us. And through that it became clear very early on that there were some thorny issues we were going to have to deal with and address properly and put our thinking caps on. 
So a couple of approaches were taken in this um, that were very, very helpful. Firstly, Sue wrote a personal letter to all the dance artists, and this was instrumental, really, in getting the signatures in. In that letter, she confirmed wholeheartedly that there was going to be no commercial financial benefit to either of the archive partners in, in, making, this pro in making this project come together. She confirmed that funds needed to maintain the archive on an ongoing basis instead of having these kind of side activities and business models, which would have been beautifully ideal, instead of that kind of abandoned and put to one side. And, and Sue confirmed that we would raise that, those funds separately from trusts and public bodies to get everybody comfortable. And she also put in this information about how we were going to treat the rehearsal footage sensitively. So I think that was absolutely instrumental. The second thing that we did was appoint an independent legal representative for the dance artists as a whole. It was unreasonable to expect them to go off and take legal advice individually and to pay for that. So as a project cost, the company fronted the cost of putting a lawyer there, making her available to the artists. And she wrote an explanatory note that then went out with the final form license and release document to the wider group of contributors. And that broke down a lot of the legalese, which was really helpful. Unfortunately, with copyright and moral rights, there is a lot of legislation that you just have to refer to to make it legally effective. But the end result is a quite impenetrable document. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's only a page long, but it's just impenetrable. Um, so the explanatory note was probably twice as long, but much easier to read, and explained the background to it, what the clauses meant, and also gave the lawyer's opinion on them, so whether they were standard or not, whether she thought they were fair or not, and any points that she thought they might want to query. Obviously, we'd been through quite a big process by this point, so we were hoping we wouldn't get too much back, and I think that was the result. She also confirmed at the bottom of that letter that she would be available to host a seminar if enough artists wanted to come together and quiz her on the spot, or even hold a conference call if that was better logistically for dancers if they were spread out geographically. Um, I don't think she was ever called upon to do that, but a few email queries did come in. They were fielded through the company so that San Giovanni could manage them, see what kind of queries were coming in, um, and deal with them that way. So I think those two instrumental tools really, really got the signatures flying in. So to conclude, it's a huge logistical task, which I think you're probably gathering now. Um, so going forwards, I think it's probably too much of a sea change to expect the theatrical world to just assign all rights over as, as is done in film and television. I just don't think that's going to happen. But maybe the midway point is that when documents are being signed, when collaborators are coming together, at that initial point when they're excited about the project, that's when you do the paperwork. And if you can include a clause in there which allows for educational uses of any recordings of the work, which is very often there, just expand that slightly and get in those magical words, digital archive. <laughs>